Now for a more specific derivation, going into one of our four lifting mechanisms and focusing on orographic uplift. Here's another picture example from Glacier National Park in the background, showing as our clouds go over mountains, they form um, and oftentimes are creating precipitation. And so to help us get in the mood for this video, our song choice here is Ain't No Mountain High Enough by Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell. So, again, this is one of our four lifting mechanisms that we'll be talking about uh, in terms of how our air can get, um, you know, can be pushed up in the atmosphere uh, or lifted up in the atmosphere in a variety of ways. And so, in this example, or this example I want to talk through in this video, I want to assume um, uh, our winds are moving from uh, left to right. And so, generally, in this case, uh, we're going to be assuming a westerly wind pattern or again where our winds are coming from the west or to assume that generally we are in the mid latitudes as the example we would look at is an Oregon specific example. Uh, and so we'll assume left is west to right being east for kind of looking or uh, pointed at it in this kind of side view um, where in front of us I guess directly in front of us would be actually facing north. Um, and so to assume then in this also we'll have our air coming off of our ocean has some amount of moisture with it, but it is not saturated. So we've already talked about saturation, what that means for humidity um, concepts, because we're going to be building off those humidity concepts in this video. And as their air rises up the mountain, um, we're going to be asking, okay, well, does it warm or does it cool? And at what rate? I've introduced you a little bit to the adiabatic uh, processes as well as uh, saturated versus unsaturated um, different rates that we'll pull at and we'll give you the specific values for those in this video we'll be using. Um, and so kind of also in the converse sense, as the air descends down a mountain, of course, again, by the adiabatic processes, uh, does it warm or does it cool and at which rate? So again, just reminding our terms here, we have our windward side where our wind goes up and our leeward side uh, where our wind goes down. And so uh, and um, we also have some of these terms. Um, and showing you here, I've actually kind of shown out which rates we will be using at different times, and we want to figure out why, or make sure we, we understand why we are using these different rates at the different places, and also, uh, you know, why we have this rain shadow effect, effect uh, that occurs on the right-hand side or that eastern side of our cascades as the example that we will use. So again, we're going to actually be going through and solving a series of equations, and I'll walk you through them all. You'll see an example like this as well. Uh, on lab or other assignments you'll be working on for this module. Uh, so you'll have to get, potentially extrapolate and, often, and use the same equations more or less even if you have different values you're provided with uh, and solving for some things uh, in the assignments that you'll be working on. So here's our example. I will be using again, an Oregon specific example. I've all just drawn it out myself. It's not fancy but it will get us through. Um, and you know, essentially the question that we're asking here is as our air moves off of the Pacific Ocean and you know, we have this uh, how essentially does that air's temperature and humidity change um, from Eugene? So we're going to assume that our air has made it over the coast range. Uh, maybe has you know, often still get do get some precipitation there, but we're going to essentially leave that out of the equation. Uh, we're going to leave that out of what we're dealing with here, and focus on Eugene here, and then really to our, the east, where as our air moves up and over the Cascade Mountains. In this example, I'm going to say it kind of travels up and goes uh, relatively mostly due east uh, up to the Three Sisters Peaks. Um, and then once it passes over that and then descends back down into Bend, you know, through that, that travel, how does our temperature and humidity of that air mass change? And so in this example we're going to use, we're going to uh, say that our air temperature starting in Eugene is at 19 degrees Celsius. And we're going to assume that Eugene is approximately 100 meters uh, in elevation above sea level. So zero meters being sea level. You know, Eugene, depending on where you take exactly the elevation in Eugene, it's a little bit variable, but we will assume approximately 100 meters is close enough for our uses. And I'm going to try and keep that uh, the same or in the sense of the Three Sisters Peaks, uh, we'll assume is about 3,000 meters and bend at 1,100 meters. So again, I'm trying to use just rounded values here to keep our numbers, um, our values pretty easy to calculate. And the rates we will be using, so again, our dry adiabatic lapse rate, or what we use when our air is not saturated, uh, to note that is um, if our air is, is going up or down, uh, 
we will have a change of one degree Celsius for every 100 meters in elevation or altitude. And similarly, for our saturated adiabatic lapse rate, or that SALR, uh, and when our air is saturated, we will have our that be a 0 0.65 degrees Celsius per 100 meters. And so that's you know, really a little bit less uh, mainly tied to some of the concepts we already talked about, like our latent heat. So some of that uh, air uh, temperature that is being released back out um, in, in terms of when we have that condensation uh, to the uh, of our water vapor is causing that difference from the dry adiabatic collapse rate. So um, we also know in this example that our lifting condensation level or the point at which as we are traveling up our mountain uh, from Eugene that our air reaches saturation that the temperature at that point is 13 degrees. So I've marked our lifting condensation level here and while we don't know what the elevation of that location is in this example that is one of the things that we can solve for. We're going to solve to find that elevation in the first part of our uh, travels. So first we want to and though stop and actually ask ourselves some questions and make sure with our community concepts we uh, know uh, where we are at in Eugene with things like vapor pressure. So you know, first we can say, well, what is the vapor pressure of our air in Eugene? Um, because we really need to be building off these humidity concepts that we talked about in an earlier lecture. And so because we know the air temperature, remember that we can then determine its sat the air's uh, saturation vapor pressure. Uh, from our either table or our graph. That's uh, this graph that I've shown on the right. I have the table on the next slide we'll go to as well. Again, using that, that, that sat table of saturation vapor pressure values uh, from Canvas, uh, or you know, again the graph here, we can trace up from this line about 19 degrees and see that our saturation vapor pressure is at about 22 millibars. So when we hit that black line, of course, here for our 19 degrees Celsius air, that's our maximum that can be held. But again, we know that the air isn't saturated. I've told you at least that much. Um, and we and we actually know that the air will not be saturated, remember, until it reaches that lifting condensation level. That lifting condensation level, I we do have the temperature for. We've provided that at 13 degrees Celsius. So we know that actually, you know, um, because of that, really we're dealing with essentially this question of dew point, right? We're, you know, it's equivalent of dew point where we're going to be raising our air up this mountain and decreasing its temperature, at least until that lifting condensation level, at that point reaching our dew point or again, a saturation point. And so we can essentially recognize that what that means is um, when we reach that point, um, our, remember our saturation vapor pressure and our vapor pressure will, will be equal. And because you know, um, we have, we're just simply with that temperature decrease up to that lifting condensation level, decreasing the capacity to hold, we're not actually decreasing the vapor pressure you know, or that amount of water vapor in the air. And you, in a back calculation sense, we know that when you reach the saturation vapor pressure, we know that that is again, also equal to the amount of vapor pressure that's in the air, which means that the vapor pressure then is essentially the same back as it was down in Eugene. And so and we're kind of going in this reverse case here, where uh, I've kind of traced this on the graph here, but again, essentially using that uh, table of saturation vapor pressure values or a graph, um, for 13 degrees Celsius air, we know that its saturation vapor pressure is at about 15 millibars. And again, because we essentially are just going from this case on the right and tracing down as our temperature decreases to our case here in the red dot on the left. Once we re hit that uh, value on the saturation vapor pressure line, we then know again our saturation vapor pressure in Eugene, and it really, and all the way up to our lifting condensation level point is going to be that 15 millibar. So again, that's that's how much vapor pressure, or how much water vapor is actually contained within the air. That does not change when simply that capacity to hold is decreasing because of temperature when we haven't reached saturation yet. So once again, we could all we go to the same table that will be on Canvas. You could find out all the same information from here if we looked at some of our values. Like our, as for example, our 13 degrees Celsius. And then we can see that our vapor pressure is that there's about 15 millibars. You know, we can round our values here for example. So we can then go and calculate our relative humidity of our air in Eugene because we know once again our actual amount that's in the air, our 15 millibars, as well as the maximum amount that can be held at our 19 degrees Celsius air in Eugene that about 22 millibars. It gives us about 0.68 or 68 percent there. 
And then, once we know our relative humidity of half our or our vapor pressure for your gene, we can then move on to figuring out what our elevation of the lifting condensation level is. So the question is, as we move from Eugene up to our lifting condensation level, do we use the dry adiabatic lapse rate, or do we use the saturated adiabatic lapse rate? And hopefully, again, as I've been talking about in the past few minutes, we know that we are not saturated yet. And so, in that sense, our air is dry, quote unquote, is not at saturation. So we should use our dry adiabatic lapse rate in this case. So again, our knowns, we know Eugene's about 100 meters in elevation, 19 degrees Celsius, and our lifting condensation level is up to 13 degrees Celsius, but we don't know the elevation at the lifting condensation level. However, we do know we are going to use the dry adiabatic lapse rate, and we know the temperature change between Eugene and our lifting condensation level, 19 minus 13, because this we know that our temperature temperature is going to change uh, at or change overall six degrees Celsius. So again, really what we're doing here on this trek from Eugene up to our lifting condensation level is going from that greater capacity to hold, shown by our black line out here, and compared to the actual amount in, of water vapor in the air. Um, and then again, that's decreasing that capacity to hold until it is equal with the amount of water vapor in the air. Our air becomes saturated. So we're going to be solving in with the equation in this way. Again, we know our air, uh, our dry adiabatic lapse rate, that's what we've placed over here on the left-hand side. Again, one degree Celsius change for every 100 meters. And we know that between Eugene and the lifting condensation level, our air changes six degrees. So again, if this is a rate of change per, we just don't know what our uh, change in elevation, so x meters. So we can simply do a simple cross multiplication. So we multiply 1 by x, and we're going in kind of in that x uh, configuration. It's 1 by 1 multiplied by x, and similarly 100 multiplied by 6 uh, gives us well, 1 times x is just x, and 100 times 6 is equal to 600. So we get x is equal to 600 meters in this case. Now, no, that is not actually our elevation of our lifting condensation level. This is simply our change in elevation in between uh, that we're having. Uh, and so because we actually began in Eugene at 100 meters, we have to add that to this change in elevation. So the lifting condensation in total, we have a 100 uh, meters for Eugene plus the 600 meters that we went up to reach the lifting condensation level, the lifting condensation level itself. Uh, in terms of its elevation is at 700 meters. So we believe the first part of our journey. Now, uh, knowing uh, our elevation of the three sisters peaks, the question is, what is the temperature and what will be our humidity uh, in those values that we have of vapor pressure and relative humidity when we reach the peaks? So now we're kind of having this next trek of the journey where we're starting one now where we began, where we left off at the lifting condensation level at 700 meters. We're going to be trekking all the way up to our 3,000 meters at our Three Sisters Peaks. So the question is, in this case, do we use the dry adiabatic lapse rate or do we use the saturated adiabatic lapse rate? Now remember, we reached saturation when we hit the lifting condensation level. Remember that we continue to rise. Hopefully, remember, we will continue to cool adiabatically which means that, you know, in turn, our capacity to hold moisture will continue to go down, which means that, hopefully remember from our prior lectures, we are now our kind of heuristic here, this way to remember how uh, what's going on with our uh, capacity to hold versus actual amount in the air. Uh, remember, our capacity to hold, shown by our black line here, is going to be decreasing, it's going to be shrinking down uh, below that you know, original at the lifting condensation level amount of vapor pressure in the air. And because of that, we know that um, we're going to be losing out this kind of outer edge. You know, anything that can't be held within that still capacity to hold will be lost out, or rather be con will conden will have condensation of back to uh, water. And of course, that could fall as precipitation, either snow, rain, whatever our temperature is. All right? So and that's where really we're going to see, in this case, on our leeward side of the mountain, lots of precipitation occurring uh, and really green vegetation as we've looked at and we saw in the previous, 
previous lecture. Uh, lecture. So that's how all that plays out. But again, just to remember our knowns, our lifting condensation level, 700 meters, 13 degrees Celsius, and we know that the peak, or where our three sisters' peaks are, are 3,000 meters. This time, you know, it's, again, it's not the elevation that's unknown, it is the temperature. We don't know what the temperature will be at the peak. So again, we know that we're going to use the saturated adiabatic lapse rate then, um, because our air will be saturated as it continues to go all the way up. It's not going to lose, you know, it's not going to go below 100% saturation. It's going to hold on to as much as it can still as it decreases in temperature, but it will lose out some of that, uh, you know, uh, moisture that it cannot hold, that vapor pressure that cannot be held any longer as a vapor, but must go be you know, condensed back to water. Um, we will have that change, and so we know that we're using that say, that rate, and we know our elevation change here between our starting point of 700 and our end point of 3,000, so we will change 2,300 meters. So, similar kind of calculation, we know our, we put our, sat, our saturated adiabatic lapse rate on the left here, so 0.65 for a change of 100 meters. Again, this time we don't know what our change in temperature is, but we do know our change in elevation at that 2300 meters. So when we cross multiply once again, 2300 times 0 0.65, 100 times x, we hit 100x is equal to 14.95. And so in this case, uh, once we divide each side by the 100, um, to make sure that we just get down to x, so we divide by the 100 over here, cancels out the 100, divide it by the 1495, uh, then we get 14.95 degrees Celsius. Basically, about 15 degrees Celsius. We'll just round that. Um, and so, to note, again, again, this is a change in temperature. This is not the final temperature at the um, at the peak. And again, as we know, as we continue to go up, we continue to cool. And we start since we started at 13 degrees Celsius, and we have to go through and say, well, our starting point was 13 degrees Celsius. We decreased 15 degrees Celsius here, so 13 minus 15. We know that our final peak temperature is negative 2 degrees Celsius. So um, we have reached the, the, now our three sisters peaks point, and we know our temperature. And so the question is, well, what are our humidity concepts? Um, you know, what, are our, our, what is our, both our relative humidity and our vapor pressure at the peak? And so and we can note that really, again, we, with our relative humidity, we, we shed some amount of moisture that could not be held as that air cooled, you know, that vapor pressure that could not be held uh, any longer as vapor, but must have, must condensed, must have condensed back into water or, you know, again, some sort of uh, liquid or solid, depending on how cold the temperature was. Um, but we, the, the air is still going to hold on to as much moisture as it can, and so that really there shouldn't be any reason that we're still at the peak below that uh, more or less 100% relative humidity uh, that we reach at this point. Now the question is also then, well, what exactly is our vapor pressure now? Because we've lost out some of you know, the, the pressure uh, that we couldn't hold on to anymore um, as that as or as that air cooled. And so we actually went back. Um, actually, the table and the graph that I provided you actually don't go below zero degrees. Um, but there are other tables and graphs out there. Um, and when you're going to be doing these calculations in a lab or assignment, I'll make sure that anything you're doing is not off of those charts so you can't calculate them. But if we were to follow that chart um, from a graph from a few uh, slides back, kind of continue a little bit back, back beyond zero degrees or you know, into negative degrees Celsius territory, we would find that the vapor pressure at about negative two degrees Celsius is approximately five millibars, so we'll just use that value here. Um, so at about five millibars uh, now of vapor pressure in the air at our peak. So now we have reached our peak, now it's time to for our air to descend down the other side of the mountain. So again, once again, given our Bend, Oregon elevation, we know at 1100 meters, what is the temperature and humidity um, values at of the air mass as it descends into a bend? And so the question is, once again, to start off, as our air descends, do we use the dry adiabatic lapse rate or do we use the saturated adiabatic lapse rate? So again, this, is, this requires us to go back to our thinking about adiabatic processes. As our air descends, 
what does it do? Hopefully you can recall that as our air descends, it is going to run into more air molecules, it is going to become compressed, and because of that it is going to warm adiabatically. Our temperature is going to go up. The question from that then is, when our air warms, what does that mean for its capacity to hold moisture? Again, hopefully we can remember from prior lectures that if our air warms, that means its capacity to hold moisture or to capacity to hold vapor pressure, in this case, actually increases. So actually, in, um, while we are not in, in, for any more going to see any decrease in our vapor pressure because we're not precipitating out or you know condensing or precipitating out any of that vapor pressure, as we were when we were going up uh, the leeward side of the mountain. And you know, we are far from a water source where evaporation would add more moisture generally to the air. Um, so we're not going to be adding any more vapor pressure to the air in this case. So actually our, our vapor pressure itself will not change. But again, that actual capacity to hold uh, or that saturation vapor pressure is going to start increasing again as we go down. And so a reminder that will, once we, if we go to relative humidity, that means our capacity to hold as it increases will get greater than our vapor pressure. And that means that we will actually move away from 100% relative humidity and go down. We'll start moving from 100 to 90 to 80 to, and so on, you know, and further and further um, down from 100% relative humidity. And thus our air will no longer be saturated. So we, our air is actually in this quote, in sense, once again, dry. And so now we should use our dry adiabatic lapse rate. So we'll be using our dry adiabatic lapse rate as we move down our mountain here. So once again, our knowns, peak at 3,000 meters, negative 2 degrees Celsius, bend at 1,100 meters. Our unknown is our temperature and bend. Again, we also know we're using our dry, dry adiabatic lapse rate, and we know our elevation change that we can calculate. So we can, once again, plug in for our equations, our dry adiabatic lapse rate on the left. We don't know our change in temperature, but we know our change in elevation of 1,900 meters, a decrease down to bend. So once we cross multiply, we get our 100x times, our is equal to 1,900. Once again, divide by 100 on each side, gives us x is equal to 19 degrees Celsius. Once again, this is our change in temperature. Remember, because we were descending in this case uh, with our air, that is going to add to our starting temperature now. And so because our, at the peak we we're at negative 2 degrees Celsius, when we do negative 2 plus 19, that gives us a value of 17 degrees Celsius when that air arrives and bends. So once again, we're having that increase in temperature, our decrease in relative humidity, our air is not saturated anymore. Just a reminder, this is what causes that rain shadow effect on the leeward side of our mountain. Um, because our air generally is going to warm as it de as it descends down the mountain, that warming air is you know, less likely to drop moisture out of it. Um, so there's a lot less moisture that precipitates out um, on the leeward side of mountains oftentimes, and that's why we see that very distinct precipitation map pattern that we've observed in the pro in the past for our state in Oregon. So as so our air moves down, we now know our temperature and bend of our air. And so once again, we finally are want to end on this question of what is our vapor pressure and what is our relative humidity and bend. So as I noted prior, as our air was descending, um, no reason that it was losing out any more vapor pressure because of condensation or precipitation, not near any moisture source, wasn't adding in any there. You know, wasn't, so it wasn't not any reason to uh, take any away, not any reason to add any. Our actual amount of vapor pressure in the air and bend as, as it was at Three Sisters Peak should basically be the same value. It should still be about that five millibars. However, how about our relative humidity? Remember, this, with the relative humidity being based on not only our vapor pressure, um, or, or, um, but also that um, capacity to hold that is based on our temperature. Well, our temperature has increased a lot now from our uh, from when we uh, started at the Three Sisters Peaks. So again, we know that still our amount in the air is 5 millibars, but if we go back to those table, the table or the graph, um, we'd find for 17 degrees Celsius that the capacity to hold is about now 19 millibars. And so when we calculate that out, 
we get about 0 0.26 or 26 percent relative humidity. And so this is why once again if we go from the beginning of Eugene to the end and bend and you'll usually see why you know, oftentimes this is part of the reason why relative humidity is so much higher in Eugene than in Bend um, because a lot of that moisture um, was lost out and going over the mountain um, and so there's usually just less uh, amount in the air even if the temperature in Eugene and Bend is, is relatively similar um, and within a few degrees as we saw in this example in terms of our starting point we started at 19 degrees in Eugene ended at 17 degrees Celsius in Bend not too much of a temperature difference there a lot lower uh, relative humidity as we see here so then that walks us through our whole process here you'll also be using for uh, doing your own assignments in this module